told her that it, you know, and she told me how it's just uh, out of reach of the fingertips of her. <laughs> and so um, I suggested that maybe they need to come in. So she did. And I said, it's confidential, but when I come in, they come in. You are not going to believe this. So I had to share. So here she comes, and um, they did. They had to take him to surgery and make him unconscious so that he would have relaxation. And they took special instruments in the OR and got that out of there. I don't think they learned a very valuable lesson. Another kind of funny story was <laughs> one that um, a guy and a girl were going down the expressway between Howell and Brighton on 96. And we get a phone call that there's been an accident. And they end up bringing in this guy who has his privates, his uh, penis was broken. And apparently she had a, a big laceration on the back of her head because she was performing um, <laughs> something and they got an accident. <laughs> so they brought them in. Those are funny stories. <laughs> Probably those are too good. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> But when you're Perfect. In Keep talking about them. <laughs> the more the better. <laughs> Those are a couple of ones I think I might have told at the demonstration. Without using names and violating HIPAA, of course. Um, there's a lot of funny ones like that, that nobody really died. Um, the biggest thing is anytime someone comes in, there's a chance you can be at the height of saving a life, and maybe somebody might laugh even when it's not really funny, because people's emotions um, are very different. We all have different emotions, and some of us laugh when something's not um, really funny. And if there's a family member standing by, and you're doing CPR on their father, uh, and someone's laughing, they don't understand that. It could be they're laughing because they can't get something undone, and they had to hand it to the guy who always thinks he's stronger, and once again, he proves it. It could be something like that, but it's um, just something that we always had to be careful of and watch. Nowadays, in the emergency room, they actually ask the family to come in. They like them to come in and just be part of if you're saving their loved one. They want them to see the effort that you made to save their loved one. And they feel that that's important for the grieving process, actually. Where before everything was hush hush secret, you swoosh them away to a private room in an area and let them sit there and wait and wait and wait. Um, but now there, the, there's different thinking on that. They're thinking that if you bring them in and let them see how hard you worked, they'll understand better what uh, how it was just not possible to save them. Part of my job would be to go with the doctor when a patient died. I would have to go with him to speak to family. So we did, we'd get them in a room, and um, he would go in and you, people know what they know, there's this gut instinct, and you can just see it on their faces when he even begins to speak. Uh, and you're just there to kind of watch, make sure somebody doesn't pass out and you might need to catch them, or just to be there and help them through this while the doctor's explaining what happened. At first, when the doctor says, I'm sorry, oftentimes they don't hear anything after that. Mm -hmm. And you might have to go back and completely re-explain what the doctor told. Because when they find out I'm sorry and they know someone that they love has died, they're unable to get past that. And they don't hear how it happened or what is going on or why didn't you save them. Sometimes they'll grab you and just shake you and want you to tell them why you let their loved one die. Um, unfortunately, you can't save everyone, but it's good to be there. And again, I told you that the most important thing is this is where myself, I felt like I can make a difference um, to help somebody, whether it's through the grieving process, um, or finding out if they're a potential organ donor, kind of uncomfortable here, their loved one has just died. You told them that. Within 15, 20 minutes, you want to know if they're an organ donor. They're not really ready to process that. Mm -hmm. So there's special training for that that <coughs> people go to so that we can now ask them to come in and they help 
through that process. There's also, uh, if it's not an organ donor that you're asking, you might be asking what funeral home? And they're not really ready for that because they don't want that person to be dead and they don't want to send them to a funeral home, but you need to know that so that that whole process can begin and you can get them to the funeral <laughs> home and all that. If someone dies outside of an emergency room or within 24 hours of an emergency room, or they come into the emergency room and go to surgery and die within 24 hours, I, and I'm not sure if this law has changed, but when I was there within 24 hours, they were automatic medical and family case. So no matter what, whether the family wanted it or not, they would be, um, they would have to have an autopsy to determine death, you know, was it. And you, at that point, you leave all the tubes that you put in place, whether it's three IVs, um, the endotracheal tube, the NG tube, which goes into the stomach, one goes in the nose into the stomach, one goes in the mouth to the lungs, and it's backwards something to explain to the family. They don't get that. Uh, but all those things all have to be left in place. You just clamp them off and leave them so the medical examiner can tell, you know, was the ET tube in the stomach? Because that's not that difficult to have that happen, and maybe they never got oxygen in the first place, and they died. Um, so those are just kind of things that you have to watch out for. Someone coming into the emergency room that Fella came into the emergency room and he said that he